Hello, my name is Ana Sofía Escona Castillo. I'm a student of Tecnológico Monterrey, Mexico, and I'm studying mechatronics engineering. I'm very happy to be joining the Climate Alliance program today. I would like to acknowledge all First Nations people from across the globe and from whatever members of our audience may be zooming from. I acknowledge that First Nation people have always lived respectfully with the earth and that in facing climate change, we can learn much from the wisdom and the knowledge. Welcome to the First Nation in the Climate Alliance Climate Talks Global Student Forum. The theme for the session is Race to the Top. Climate action is becoming a race to the top where global leaders have finally recognized the urgency and scale of transition needed and the importance placed on a fair climate action plan for communities. In this session, you will hear from our student leaders, climate innovators and experts on how mindset shift is already on the way to raise the ambition on climate action and the power of collective advocacy. This session is titled Race to the Top. As momentum for a global transition towards a low carbon economy strengthens, the need for innovative and creative approaches to sustainability will be in high demand from future employees. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Vice Chancellor and President of the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Professor Attila Brown. As is custom, I start today by acknowledging that UNSW Sydney stands on the ancestral lands of the Bidjigal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this place. Thank you, Ina, for the opening proceedings and congratulations to Team Glick on being joint winners of the 2021 Climate Alliance Global Hackathon. Your design for helping decarbonise building design with your ingenious use of waste is exactly the type of innovative thinking that the world needs today. To everyone else and to all of you watching on this Earth Day, I say welcome. Welcome to the Climate Talks Student Forum, hosted by the International Universities Climate Alliance. UNSW is a really proud founder of this alliance, and over the past two years, its membership has soared from 35 to more than 50 universities across the globe. Now, the recent IPCC report told us reminded us in no uncertain terms that action is needed now if we are to avoid the most catastrophic scenario for our climate, for us as a species and for the planet. We are without doubt at a critical juncture in our environment. As a highly engaged global citizen, you know more than most that without immediate action, every facet of our lives will be affected by climate change. Your future jobs just being one of them. Whether your study is in science, engineering, healthcare, economics or the arts, or a myriad of other and critical subjects, you will be asked to step up to help society navigate the effects of climate change. Universities are in a unique position to lead the way in preparing students for the transition that must occur in all our economies. Knowledge is central to tackling this challenge and this existential threat. It has a special quality that allows us to break down complex challenges in a way that can be transformative and restorative. We can only solve this crisis with the right interdisciplinary community working together and ultimately improve society for all. Just as we turn to experts to guide us through the pandemic, so too we must trust experts to show us the way to mitigate the very worst of the climate crisis. The way we use energy, grow crops, conserve water, the way we prepare our hospitals, nurses, doctors, medical researchers for the health impacts of climate change, the way we design our very infrastructure and build our cities. The way we insist our idle neighbours become reliant on the ocean for their income. These are all topics we must address as a matter of urgency. And fortunately, many solutions exist today to solve these challenges. Today's university students and those who follow you will be at the absolute forefront of transforming our global economy to incorporate a more sustainable, healthy and importantly just framework for communities around the world. We should draw upon the unrivaled expertise that is held in the world's greatest learning institutions, universities, to assist in developing achievable regional and global solutions. Regardless of the career path that you're setting out on now, you will likely have several throughout the course of your life. A diverse skill set is essential and will give you not only a competitive advantage, but fulfilment throughout your life. 
Universities are well placed to help you, so you'll be well equipped to help industry, government and community leaders and understand complex problems. We've been warned that after decades of inaction on climate change, there is no time left to waste. But the IPCC report also gives us hope. We have the technology, the know-how and the money to save humankind. We just need the collective will. We need leadership at every level of society and from every person. We need collaboration. The International Universities Climate Alliance and the Climate Talks Forum is a brilliant way of bringing university students from across the world together to share ideas, to partner on effective and concrete climate action. There are already great instances of universities within the Alliance developing interdisciplinary programs. UNSW, for example, has teamed up with the UK government on the Global Oceans Account Partnership. This is aimed at restoring ocean health and reducing poverty in developing countries. The University of Sao Paulo is working with Harvard and a global consortium of health experts to lead the Planetary Health Alliance. This alliance will help governments, health professionals understand and monitor the impact of health outcomes like heat stress and importantly, waterborne diseases. The University of Oxford is establishing a nature positive university network to help communities understand their biodiversity footprint and their carbon emissions when seeking to transform to a more sustainable campus. I urge you to devise new and innovative ways to partner with your peers, regardless of your geography or discipline. Strength that comes with unity of purpose is absolutely invaluable. As someone with a passion for preparing students to make meaningful contributions to society, I also encourage you to make your voice heard on what you need from the higher education sector. Is it training to help develop resources for industry or government on best practice on climate change? Is it more virtual events and talks where students can network internationally, share their own experiences and build those critical collaborations? Is it more work integrated learning and internships to give you a deeper understanding of how you can help shape the industries that you will join? Right now, pooling your intellectual firepower, drawing upon your passion for climate action is a worthy endeavour. The IPCC report is a clarion call for each and every one of us to show leadership on climate action. I truly hope that this forum will inspire you to renew your determination to reach across continental divides and find this global solution we so sorely need. I hope you will also feel well supported by the members of the International Universities Climate Alliance. So thank you and I wish you all the very best. Excellent. Good morning and thank you for that great introduction. My name is uh, Associate Professor Will Glamour and I'll be chairing this first session. Uh, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Earth Day and start off with a uh, congratulations that we're going to celebrate a great Earth Day today by through, through this panel discussion and get things going properly. So uh, I'm fortunate enough to be hosting this panel discussion today and we're really going to dive into climate resilient communities and what they're doing to manage, in a local sense, the climate change pressures that are being faced around the world. We've got a great list of people here. I'm very fortunate to be uh, leading the discussion, and but I don't want to do all the talking. I'd like to very quickly uh, move the discussion to our panelists and make sure that they get the chance to uh, have a discussion about what's happening in their world and then hopefully amongst each other. So in order to make sure that they get to speak the most, I want to start off the morning by asking each panelist a quick question, getting some background on who they are, and then moving to a broader discussion. So if I may, I'll kick off by starting uh, with one question that says to each panelist, please introduce yourself, your research, and how your local communities are responding to climate change in your region. So I might just go around the room here and let everyone else get the opportunity to introduce themselves and kick off this conversation. So let's start with Professor Grant Blaschke. Can you tell us where you are, what you're thinking and, and what's happening in your local communities? Yes, really wonderful to be involved in this today and uh, great to see so many students. I'm uh, Associate Professor Grant Blaschke at the Nossel Institute for Global Health at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And uh, the area that I'm particularly interested in is the uh, mental health impacts of climate change. 
I'm the lead clinical advisor for Beyond Blue, which is the largest mental health not-for-profit in Australia. And the issue I wanted to quickly talk about was making sure that students working in this very ambitious and important area look after their mental health. It's a pretty intense topic and it's a marathon and make sure that you're looking after yourself at the same time while you're, while you're working in this important area. Thanks, Will. Oh, that's great, Grant. Thank you so much. Yeah, mental health is a huge and you know, I must say, uh, when Earth Day first started, I remember sitting as a student myself wondering, how the heck are we going to do anything as, a, as you know, from my little position here? And it is overwhelming, isn't it? It's very, it's very overwhelming. So yeah, let's let's it's, move it's forward. Really important. Yeah, thank you so much. Let's move forward and get the same question to Miss Lenecki Rodin from University of West Indies. Can you give us your background, Lenecki? All right. So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lenny Corodin. I'm an infill candidate at the University of the West Indies. My research focuses on basically the production of biodiesel from algae. So the algae that I use are chlorella vulgaris, microalgae, and of course, macroalgae, sargassum natons. So the fact that there's an inconsistency within the Caribbean as it regards to the spread of oil and gas reserves, as they are concentrated in Trinidad and more recently Ghana, um, most energy models within the Caribbean has been focused heavily on the importation of seaborne petroleum Im imports. And so my research basically looks at um, erasing the expense that comes with um, importing petroleum and, of course, increasing energy security in the region. Uh, as it pertains to climate change, of course, you know, algae biomass um, in most recent years, I've received a lot of attention because of their high growth rate and the fact that they have a potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is one of the sticking point of climate change, of course. Um, as it pertains to what has been done in my community to combat climate change, you know, I must commend firstly the University of the West Indies for being a leader in this space, um, for leading especially research um, in the field of climate change. And of course, this research has been used to inform policy. Um, Jamaica has been very pivotal when it comes on to enacting um, and adopting uh, in their national development plans, climate change policies and measures really to mitigate the effects of climate change. And so, you know, the, the policies that Jamaica have that Jamaica has enacted has been found to be very multi-sectoral in its action. And this is definitely due to the research coming out of the University of the West Indies. There are a lot of community projects happening across the Caribbean. Um, and research happening, especially in different um, Caribbean islands. So particularly Belize, I must commend um, Abel Centella, who has been doing a lot of research, especially as it pertains to developing a regional drought tool. Um, and we know that drought has been an effect of climate change. Excellent. Excellent. Sounded like the thing's getting exciting there. Look, there's there's so much happening. It's great to hear that the, the Caribbean is really leading the way. And I know that we've also got uh, Mr. Scott Lance, Lance Scott, sorry, uh, of, uh, from the University of West Indies as well. And maybe you could also give us your uh, opinion on how things are going there and what is happening in the local communities. Lance, are you on mute there? Can you hear us, Lance? You're just coming a little bit on mute. Um, awesome. There you are. Awesome. All right. So thank you very much for that uh, brief introduction. My name is Lance Scott. I am a PhD candidate 
at the University of the West Indies. Um, my research focuses on rural farming, um, overall agriculture, uh, with a focus on food security. Um, we always talk about the sustainable development goals, and this is a pivotal part of what I am doing uh, to basically eradicate hunger. Um, so I'm looking at different strategies that farmers use to mitigate against climate change in order to improve um, their farming systems and overall improve their uh, farming output and subsequently um, improve the, uh, the, the national output that Jamaica puts out um, in terms of its food production. Interesting. And so, Lance, this is actually for uh, eating food? It's not for biodiesel or some other product? Right. So, you know, my focus is primarily on um, food security. Um, so it's being able to, because, you know, small island developing states like Jamaica, uh, they continue to face uh, these, these major challenges, um, especially considering the, the volatility um, of the world economy. You know, we look at the, the war currently in Ukraine, and that is affecting us here in Jamaica because the rural farmers who normally rely on fertilizers to grow their crops, they're unable to get the, the amount that they need. And, you know, the price has also increased dramatically. So we have some major shocks and stressors taking place on the global economy that is affecting um, the local economy. But our local farmers, they're finding means and ways to adapt um, because they tend to be very resilient um, to change. So they oftentimes they use, you know, local fertilizers such as organic fertilizers, so, you know, what you call foal, um, foal manure or from cows and pigs and so on. So, you know, it's, it's great work. And, you know, I look forward to talking more about it. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think what you've highlighted there is interconnectivity of all of us around the world, that even a local farmer in Jamaica is struggling with the war in, in Ukraine and, and the connectivity. And I think, you know, I'm hoping that this panel highlights that. If I move from, from you guys in the West Indies over to, let's say, to Ira Martina Drupati, you are based on the other side of the world, right? You're completely at the uh, National University of Hong Kong. So talk about connectivity. Here we are. We're directly connected. We've moved over. No? You, you can tell us then. Give us a little introduction of you and what you're dealing with there. Yes. Uh, good morning and happy Earth Day from Singapore, everyone. So I'm Ira, and I'm representing not the University of Hong Kong. I think that's for Mia. Uh, I'm representing National University of Singapore. Um, and I'm wearing um, several hats this morning, actually. First of all, like most of you, I'm a student, a PhD student. Uh, I'm concerned about the climate crisis, how it's impacting local communities, and of course, very eager to be part of the solution. Uh, however, secondly, I'm also a full-time energy policy researcher here at the university. Uh, and thirdly, although I am based in Singapore, I'm actually from Indonesia, the largest archipelago, uh, archipelagic country in the world, uh, as some of you may know. Uh, and uh, the focus of my PhD research is actually to examine energy poverty and gendered energy needs in marginalized urban communities in Indonesia. And in this regard, I focus on the role of women in deploying uh, small scale renewable energy systems and in doing so strengthening their community resilience against climate change, uh, specifically as concerns energy poverty. Thank you. Can I can I just follow up on that and say what sort of renewable energy systems are you encouraging or promoting? Um, I'm not promoting anything, to be honest. I'm just observing these communities because I think one one thing we need to remember, and maybe we often forget as in our privileged positions as researchers and acad academics, is that local communities, marginalized local communities, have their own solutions already, despite the fact that they don't have 
you know, the best enabling uh, environment from policymakers and the government. And uh, what I'm trying to observe and understand is how they are already trying to solve their own energy poverty problems by deploying, uh, you know, a wide range of uh, uh, renewable energy system solutions like, you know, solar PVs, micro hydros, biogas, uh, improved cook stoves and the like. Wow. OK, that's really interesting and really challenging at, at, at any scale. but. Once you get into the island communities, it's really challenging to do any sort of research that connects the dots has been my experience. It, it's every dot is individual and unique and very, very hard to try to bring it all together. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you for that. And now, uh, last but not least, we're going to introduce Miss Maya Chan. And maybe I've said that wrong, so please correct me. And I think you're from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Is that correct? So please yes. over to you and, and again, so introduce yourself, your research, and if you've got any experience with how local communities are responding to climate change or what you're involved in that in that piece. Yes, um, thank you very much for having me in this panel and happy Earth Day for everyone. Um, my name is Hermia. I am a final year bachelor's student um, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So I will be maybe providing a different perspective because personally I'm not a researcher, um, but so Hong Kong is a coastal city. We face um, sea level rise as one of the biggest threats. And at the same time, we are also very, very crowded, um, tall, like skyscraper city. So heat island effects is very serious in Hong Kong as well. So two major challenges I personally identified will be heat wave and also flooding, sea level rise, etc. cetera. Um, however, Hong Kong, despite being a coastal city, um, the awareness on climate change or climate justice, these type of issues is quite low. So uh, my work is mainly focusing on raising awareness on the interdisciplinary nature of climate change. So um, my organization, Network of Environmental Student Societies, we um, organize activities, workshops, dialogues with local communities, with um, youth, um, to talk about the interconnection between climate change and health, climate and finance, um, climate and um, green jobs, what are the opportunities out there um, addressing so youth in general, what could, how should they contribute to climate change in general in the future or right now, um, and also providing capacity building, etc. So these are my work. Wow, okay. So I mean, I think that does a great job of pulling it all together. So everyone is doing something completely different uh, but everyone's work is interdisciplinary in some way you know so it's not i guess if i'm a student i see just from listening to you five all the different opportunities that exist in getting involved in the climate space and how you can make a difference everything from biodiesel to mental health to food security to uh thinking about interdisciplinary actions on their own. So, I mean, it's it's a really challenging and in some ways the opportunities are are so big that sometimes they're daunting. And I'm just wondering, you know, if you're a someone just getting involved in this, you're a student and, and you know, a few of you are here, where, where do you start? How do you start to make a difference? How do you uh, get out there and support the communities around you? What, where, What's the first steps you'd recommend to people in this space? And I'd like to make this, if we can, a bit more of a an open discussion. So feel free to jump in. But let's start with Grant. We'll go back to the top of the order. And Grant, how, what do you recommend with people, I guess, in your position particularly, dealing with a million different things they can manage and feeling it's like it's so hard to make a difference? And where, where can they make a difference, particularly supporting the local communities? Yeah, thanks, Will. I think if you're working in this very challenging area, as you've said, it's such a big topic and it's got the potential to be overwhelming. So you need a bit of philosophy in your backpack. And a couple of things I would say there is, you know, an environmental issue, climate change issues, they can tap into your own sort of grandiosity. You're going to save the planet. You're going to do everything, you know, and I see a procession of very enthusiastic students come to me. And I'm like, that's great. But guess what? Not one person on their own is going to solve this. So have a good look at what are you good at? 
like you know what's your piece of the puzzle your little piece that you're going to work on and, and do a fantastic job in that area and the second thing I'd say in regards to that is it's all about finding good teachers and good mentors you know we're such an interconnected world take a risk and contact the very top people in your field you know senior people love talking about how great they are so you ring them out you say oh can we have an email can I have a zoom meeting with you you know, I just want to find out how did you do such great work on energy renewable? You know, and they love helping you. But every year with my students, you know, 10% of them take me up on this challenge and their careers go off because they suddenly link in with these amazing people. And the others sort of let their self-doubt get the better of them. So chase good mentors around and look after your mental health at the same time. It's great advice. And I do think that you can get a little intimidated by going for the, you know, the big names in the field or the people you haven't met so far, but I'd back you up hundred percent. Pick the person that is most, you know, you have, you admire the most and start with that and then, and see, because in this new world, as you see with teams where, you know, we've got people from all over the world on the call here, it's easy to have a conversation and a mentor doesn't have to be, someone you meet with every week for you know a, a year it can be someone that you mm. just have a conversation with and and occasionally uh, build a, rep, a, a, a relationship with over a long period of time yeah it is really and maybe i'll take that then to Lineka. i mean the the idea that you mentioned biodiesel and you know that was one of those things to me 15 odd years ago maybe that was going to save the world Right, we're all gonna be able to drive around cars that were powered by, you know, sugar cane or oil or something like this, and and it sort of became one of those um, ideas that had double prongs, you know, and it was great, but then all of a sudden people weren't eating food anymore because they were growing sugar cane. So these ideas of how do we get the local communities to um, get value from it? Without maybe these, uh, you know, these these unknown bad things that can happen in the background, and I guess just that experience that you may have of um, dealing with things and finding opportunities for local communities to actually get involved and do something. Okay, so thank you for that. So. Um... First, I, I actually had a contribution to the, the question um, where young people, that, that looked at young people getting involved um, in climate action. And uh, I must say first that young people should strive to build their capacity and learn more about um, climate change. Yes, we know that climate change um, comes with effects such as drought, sea level rise, extreme events, you know, more intensified hurricanes. But, you know, you want to look at how exactly these events or catastrophic um, factors are affecting our communities. And then you want to look at what are actions that can be done from different levels. So what can you do as an individual? You know, we all we always hear the, the saying of the three R's, recycle, reuse, and um, what's the other R? <laughs> Reduce. Reduce. Reduce, right. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're all familiar with the three R's, and I'm sure that a lot of young people are too. But um, so, so that is at the individual level. Then you can take it a step further with collaborating with your peers, you know, forming different groups or joining um, different uh, foundations or organizations or NGOs, getting involved in action, you know. And once you come together, then you can start to attract more resources. So this is where you can start applying for grants to coordinate or, or execute different um, community projects. You know, you might notice that there is a river in your community that is heavily polluted. So you can probably make an approach to your local university to see if research can be done to, to identify the point of pollution or pollution. And then you want to start um, organizing activities that can then further reduce or mitigate the level of pollution that the river is experiencing. 
And of course, you know, in terms of building your capacity and awareness, you want to not only know about um, what is happening, but the effects of what is happening so that you're able to attract these grants. So what is happening is that the river is being polluted. The effect of this is that fish and other um, living organisms in the river are affected. People's livelihood can be affected as well because you know people might rely on the river for washing, cooking, and and other things, recreational activities. People might even, you know, so so basically, um, th this is what I would say to young people, uh, especially those who want to get involved in climate action. Um, and there's so many other ways. There's so many issues, but you know, I leave you with that for now. Mm. Oh, that's great. I mean, there are so many ways to get involved. And and the, I think coming back to Grant's comment, the way that you feel you can have the biggest impact is probably the most important, right? If you can make a difference at whatever scale that is and makes it feel that you can move forward with some, you know, whatever it may be or some action, that's really what you can take away and keep building on. I, I might jump over then to Singapore and, you know, uh, Ira, you were talking a minute about their work in island nations, and one of the things I've found, like, and I'm interested in your your feedback, is the more a uh, a community has in terms of education and resources on these issues, the broader their general view is. So they can go from looking at their home to their neighborhood to their community to their island to the global situation. And I'm just wondering if you see you know, something similar in your work in that people are able to uh, really dig into their local community, but see where they fit in the global community, depending on the resources and educations that they've been provided. Um, thanks, Will, for that question. Yes, I mean, actually, I, I feel like I live that reality every day because I'm an Indonesian living in Singapore and although Singapore is an island state I'm sure we can all appreciate that the kind of climate challenges that Singapore is facing is very different to that of island communities in Indonesia by function of availability or lack thereof or, or of resources uh, that you know many island communities in Indonesia right and so I think, you know, Singapore is in a very privileged position in which they can actually take a step back and not just be focused on these very immediate uh, climate challenges because they are fortunate enough to not be at the forefront in that sense, right? Because as we know, uh, it is these marginalized communities that bear the, the full brunt of the climate challenges but have the least resources. And uh, so, yes, I think part of my struggle every day, and I'm sure many others in this uh, in this uh, meeting today, is that we want to use our position of privilege to be able to, you know, uh, help uh, marginalized communities uh, uh, kind of uh, amp to amplify their voices, to shine a light on the challenges that they face, and also to amplify their voices to the powers that be in that sense. Mm. Yeah, that's I mean, the amplifying the voices is, is a really strong comment and really something I think we all love to achieve, but it's very hard to actually, uh, you know, happen in real real time and real, you know, see see the outcomes of that. Maybe I'll, I'll go to uh, Hermia Chan. The, I mean, you talked about interdisciplinary work and things like heat waves that do go across multiple communities and and is there a way that we can help amplify those voices and help you know really bring out some of these bigger broader more complex issues and help do well in doing so help the people on the ground yeah we work with um and also regularly communicate with local ngos that actually do community dialogues with the local community and one of the huge challenge that we um observe is that how to better communicate climate change with um, the local community. If you're seeing climate change and giving out all the science, all the interesting terms um, to them, they're like, yeah, but what's about it? It's like a scientist thing, right? But if we're just 
instead of climate change, we say like, oh, do you feel hotter this year? Or like, just focus on the word heat. Um, and they were like, yeah, this year is slightly different. What makes like what what happened to the climate um what make these changes so how to better communicate the seriousness of um heat waves or like other problems um would be one of the challenge especially with like climate resilience climate adaptation i personally i don't know if i found that problem as well or like anyone who is non-english speaking um we couldn't find an exact translation in our own language and oftentimes even if there is one it doesn't really translate the meaning of adaptation or resilience. Like if I just translate it directly to Chinese, yes, you can still communicate it, but no one would actually understand or like not a general public could understand. So I think language barrier is one of the huge challenges that we try to overcome at the moment. Um, and I also really want to respond to what young people could do um, to, to accelerate the climate action. I think there are a few things Speaking from personal experience, um, first of all, with the mentality, I think um, as a student, especially in Asian communities, we we're always taught to like listen to your adults and not to say so much when they're doing their stuff. Um, I think it's very important to see yourself as an equal um, as compared to an adult. If there isn't a youth representative spot in your school about climate action or sustainability, just go ahead and email them, go ahead and talk to them. Hey, here are things that we think you can change. Um, perhaps we can work with you. Um, and also, and the other thing will be find your own interests. So let's say with um, Lan's interest would be food security, with um, our interest would be uh, gender and also um, rural communities. So find your own interests that will help you stay motivated in long terms. Um, instead of just, oh, anything I can do in climate change there. Climate change is such a huge topic that covering every aspect. So finding your own interest and finding your own position, as Grant said, your own little puzzle in this gigantic um, map is very important. Yeah, that's great that's advice. And you know, we've got about three minutes left, so I might take that uh, impetus and actually go around the room. In the last three minutes, um, I'll start with you, Lance, and maybe so you're a student you're listening to this video you know you're wondering what i can do do you have any uh words of wisdom that from maybe your own personal perspective that you might pass on to someone to say how can i how can i get over this overwhelming sense that everything's going bad and and, and what can i actually do to make an action do you have any any advice to that student listening and you're on mute lance Uh, you're on mute. There you go. Yeah, I think a big thing has been, you know, the whole uh, notion of persons uh, feeling the climate crisis and, you know, thinking that the world is going to end. And this links closely to to what, um, you know, uh, Doc is doing over there um, in terms of looking at mental health. What persons can do um, is to get involved. I would say, you know, get involved. Oftentimes, there are a lot of non-government organizations that are, you know, pushing um, for persons to uh, to be aware of climate change and to act accordingly. And I'd say, you know, as a student, you can get involved. Um, in Jamaica, there are several, and there are so many um, youth organizations um, that are geared towards um, climate awareness and climate justice. So I'd say, you know, one of the main things is to get involved. And I'm pretty sure, you know, in Singapore, um, in Hong Kong, there's there's a lot. But I am on social media and I see even future um, climate, you know, climate for future, or future climate, um, Greta Thunberg yeah. and so on. Get involved and, you know, you, you touch on a, a good thing, William, in terms of connectivity. We are now connected more than ever before so I can now send, um, you know, uh, Miss uh, Her Hermia a message and we can coordinate something on climate change. So we are very connected and I think we should use that platform. That's excellent. Yeah, I agree. The great advice. How about Grant from you? A closing comment on how, how, how can somebody uh, manage and move forward? Okay, so what I would say is keep up the hope budget. What do I mean by that? 
there's a lot of bad news happening in social media and but don't forget the incredibly great stuff that's happening in science look what happened with covid vaccines in about two minutes we worked it out you know so a lot of hope and the business community is is onto this now and we're going to see a change as big as the industrial revolution and as fast as the digital revolution and you know my grandkids won't recognize the world that i was in and that's great yeah that's great i agree it's happening really quick all of a sudden uh Ira from uh from singapore your thoughts um maybe just very quickly i just want to take this opportunity to to highlight the plight of marginalized communities and I think uh, it's important for us, uh, you know, in academia to 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 remember that marginalized communities are already solving their own climate challenges in their own innovative and creative ways. And all, what they need is uh, a better enabling environment that empowers them further. And we shouldn't assume that we know the best you know, well, for, well, the best solutions for these communities. What we need to do is go to these communities, engage them. Uh, it's our job as researchers to listen to what their needs are and to amplify their voices. We should probably assume we don't, right? We assume the opposite, assume that we need to listen. And closing, last, last but not least, Lenica, any last moment, little snippet you want to add on as well? Definitely. So I just want to highlight the fact that the region, the Caribbean region, has adopted a lot of policies um, geared towards um, enacting climate change and moving towards sustainable development. But one of the things that plague the region is the fact that we are not the most effective when it comes on to policy implementation. And this is where our gap that young people can seek to fill. So you can look at the policy documents, they can be found online, or you can reach out to your government agencies responsible for those areas and find out what are the, the strategic um, action items under each of those um, policy objectives and see what projects you can coordinate. And this is an easy way for you to get funding and support from your government officials to make it easier for you to get your project idea off the ground. Great, excellent. All right, we run out of time. I want to, on behalf of the Climate Alliance and, and everyone here, just say what a fabulous discussion that was. We, we covered just about every topic you could cover in, in climate change this morning. Uh, it was a real privilege to be able to lead the discussion and thank you so much. Uh, again, have a great Earth Day. Go out and make a difference. Uh, get your hope a, a bank built up. Reach out to mentors. <laughs> and let's make some action happen. So yes, love for the world. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate that. And let's get out there and, and make, make a difference. Thank you so much. Take care. Hi, I'm Michelle Manzur. I am, um, I recently graduated in accounting and finance at UNSW. And I am also a student studying leadership and management. Currently, I'm teaching various finance courses at UNSW Business School. And I, my recent um, uh, area of interest is climate finance. Today we have Anga Bia, and she is uh, working in Blue Economy, and she is a climate activist. And first, we would like to know how she ended up with um, being a climate activist. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Um, yeah, my name is Anga Bia, and I'm based in Kabecha in South Africa, and I am 26 years old. Um, basically how I went into um, activism is started at such a young age from primary school, working with the Interact Club, being passionate about the less fortunate, caring for dogs, caring for the elderly and raising funds for them. So I think that was very instilled in me from home, church and my community and school. And then when I got to varsity, I was a mentor to kids. So I was very um, 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 invested in helping um, the less fortunate in, in every direction. So when I started studying sustainable development and going into marine ocean um, courses, I found a love for the ocean and, 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 and 
that the ocean is really my my place of peace and scenario um peace and um you know it just gives me so much zen. So when you find out about all the things that are currently happening in the ocean and the impacts it has, you you know, you are drawn to, to, to see what you can do in your own right. So I was very fortunate to, to be given a role to be um, African Youth Waste Co- Coordinator at Sustainable Seas Trust, where I currently work. And I work with um, educating the youth with the impacts of plastic pollutions on our oceans. So that's basically my nine to five, and that's what I focus on. and um, Trying to, trying to take the, the content that the scientists give us of like the impacts of you know, climate change and plastic pollution and trying to make it um, um, where kids can actually understand it, you know, and, and you break it down where um, they, they understand it in not the scientific terms, but how can, what role can they do um, in, in, in bettering the solution? So that's what I'm currently doing now. And yeah, I, I am, I'm very for the youth. I'm very um, for education because I really think those two things hand in hand can really um, help address a lot of the issues that we're facing with climate change. So yeah, youth and, and, and education are very, very um, critical in, in, in helping our currently current situations that we face. Yeah. That's great. And Enka, this is a big step. Like, you know, you have like a concern for, you know, plastic pollution and then taking a step like this, that, you know, starting your own, um, you know, business on this. Uh, I would like to know how much like it took you to actually start this venture and think of like, you know, getting capital, having a support, you know, you know, get any uh, support from investors initially. Okay, so currently the business I have going is um, seaweed farming. I'm trying to tap into seaweed farming. So hopefully um, just a bit of a background about seaweed is that it collects a lot of carbon dioxide. It's really good for the ecosystem in the ocean. It really um, tackles a lot of the SGD goals. It provides jobs. It's it's really um, an amazing source of of, 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 of um sustainability in in many um, spheres in the ocean and for the 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 economy of South Africa. So I started the venture in 2020. I studied in Sweden. I did my master, a master's program in Gothenburg University Mm -hmm. where I was exposed to seaweed and when I got there, I, as I was just reminded of the potential of what it can do for Africa. So I came back to South Africa and I just knocked on doors telling them, hey guys, you know about seaweed? <laughs> um, this is what I learned in Sweden and I want to do it in South Africa. So it's a lot of networking um, in the beginning. It's a lot of um, like presentations, business plans, entering a lot of competitions that you have to do in order to get your name out there to, to see what you can do. And currently I'm still doing this alone, but I do have mentors that I speak to that are mostly based in Europe where I studied. And when it comes to capital and stuff like that, I will be honest, most of the money that's been spent on my business currently has come from myself. Um, So because it's still in the starting idea phase and planning stages, there's not much capital yet, but there is now like talks of capital when you start speaking to government. So the first um, steps you need to tick off is having a, a very Um, good, solid business plan, you know, speaking to the right people in government organizations who who speak to other farmers who are in the industry and you try better your business plan, you try better your your vision. And what happens is they put you in certain groups, institutions where you can learn. So you, there are incubators that you can go into, you know, where they find, they go into more detail into your business plan and those incubators will then introduce you to investors. So that's how some of the cycles that you can go through but currently I'm just working hand on hand with mentors so I think for anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur the first thing you have to do is be very clear about your vision and then you network you go on LinkedIn LinkedIn is a great source of meeting people from like different parts of the world Mm -hmm. that are very aligned with what you want to do and then you just reach out to them and they give you solid advice and then once you have a proper plan that's when you can start talking about investments and capital so i'm currently at that stage now where i'm trying to also like get some funding and there is funding available you know especially being educated being young being black being from africa you know 
tackling things that are affecting the economy and um, the climate is you're taking a lot of boxes. So, you know, people are eager to, to, to hear you out and, and, and see how they can help in, 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 better, in bettering your vision for not just for yourself, but for Africa as well. Yeah. You just mentioned right now that people are there to hear about your idea. But when you were talking about this uh, particular, um, you know, this initiative of uh, how to mitigate this uh, plastic pollution, were people aware of this in Africa at that oh. time you were talking about it? Okay. Um, the plastic plastic pollution thing is my nine to five. So I have, I'm not like a full on entrepreneur. So I have a job. My job is the plastic pollution. That's what I focus on. And I'm hired by a company called Sustainable Seas Trust in South Africa. Then the farming, um, the what you see on LinkedIn, my blue economy, my website, that's my personal endeavors, which is mm -hmm. completely different. But the, the both of the companies are aligned to bettering the ocean. So it's not too far apart. So that's what I love. But what I'm doing is that like, I can have a nine to five that pays all my bills. And then on the side, I have my business, which I'm trying to grow. So th those are the two different things yeah, that I'm currently doing at the moment. But how about the others like around you when you, you know, talk about this, um, you know, uh, telling them that how important this is, um, mm -hmm. how much it is affecting the climate change. Are they aware of it? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, some I, I still believe that most of the people are not even uh, understanding the gravity of climate change. Hundred percent, hundred percent. The it's 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 difficult um, because I think it's 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 crazy. Like the people that see it first, I would say, are like the farmers, the people in rural areas, the people who are more in the outskirts of the city. They are the ones that really see climate change when they things aren't growing. When people are talking about locusts coming and they've never seen these in years and droughts in certain parts of the city, you know. So the conversation is starting. It's starting with weather that the weather's, you know, it's really cold, there's floods, there's this. So the conversation is there. When it definitely comes to I'm 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 thinking um climate change. And when it comes to plastic pollution, it's it's just a very educational thing. It's it's mm -hmm. it's it's such a fight with for me, it's also like a fight with just municipality because the communities feel as if, you know, we're paying our taxes, we're paying for all of these things, and the government is not coming to collect and um, the rubbish. So we we gonna have to burn this rubbish. We have to, you know, that's what we're seeing. A lot of communities that just take it up to the they take the responsibility their own hands and they just end up burning a lot of the plastic pollution. So it's it's a lot of stuff where it's politically in, um, influenced education influence and i think those two things and i really hope that businesses and corporations can come in um, um, um to because they have the the power to you know to know to to stop the the one like some of the lot of products that we we see flying around they have the responsibility it can't be always the con customer and consumer because mm -hmm. it's cheap but they don't have money and they want something that's convenient so obviously that's what they'll go for um so yeah i think Politics, business, and education are very um, are the major influences of um, people's knowledge about plastic pollution and, and climate change. Yeah, great. And um, what advice would you have for students who are interested in innovation and have a passion for the environment? I say definitely start. You know, start anywhere. Um, just start. You you don't it. Um, network, as I said, meet the right people, see what you are interested in, literally Google up the keywords on LinkedIn or Google and follow those people, send them an inbox. People are really kind, you know, <laughs> some people are really are nice and they have time to just hear you out and give you some advice, introduce you to someone else that you can speak to. And um, the, as I said, like the, 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 the universe is covered by 70% of water. So the ocean economy, the blue economy is so wide, you know, it's not just, um, don't ever think that you are closed off to one particular 
um, vision. You know, the more people you meet, the more you might find yourself being interested in something else. And I really think um, I'm really um, for global conversations. I really think people need to speak to other people in different parts of the country. Because it's it's very insightful just to know what's happening in Asia, what's happening in South America and in India. They have we all have coastlines. So, you know, how how are you trying to better your coastline and what are you guys doing? And I think those conversations and like conversations we're having now are very crucial in your growth and in my growth as well, because I learn from people as 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 as, as I as I carry on with my journey. So, yeah, my advice is to start, is to network and not to give up, you know, and it's 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 it's, it's a long journey. It's not easy, but definitely just, you know, be go a day at a time and you'll see the progress in your business and your networks and everything kind of falls into place one day and it makes sense. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my advice. And apart from LinkedIn, any other platform you think they should um, join to? Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, I am part of um, I'm part of a program called Seaweed Ambassadors. So let's say you aligned with um, let's say you like climate finance. I am definitely sure there are groups that are about that talk about climate finance. So join groups like that. Um, I'm also part of a group called Ubuntu. I'm also part of organizations um, in Europe um, which focus on sustainability. It's a lot of um, professionals in different fields of sustainability. So you hear people from, you know, the clothing sector to recycling plastic, durable plastic, to people making recycling coffee beans. It's it's just it's such a wide um, um, scope of people. So join groups like that. Um, it's called Sustainable Vista. It's it's based in Europe, but they're always online. They're always open. So Sustainable Vista, Seaweed Ambassadors, groups like Ubuntu, um, um, those are very really, um, great. I love looking at UN um, posts as well, like UN Youth Climate Posts, um, COP26, things like that. Those. Um, all the COP information is very good. So yeah, definitely those are the things you should look out for. And then when it comes to financing as well, I think go to your local government, you know, go to your local government, tell them who you are, tell them you're interested in this particular business. And they literally give you emails and books and, you know, like those books of what's currently happening in the economy in your particular city and all that information. And then you just follow everyone there. So that's other information um, I would give out. As you mentioned that, um, you know, students who want to take initiative, they can also reach out their local governments for more information about how the financing is going on in those sectors. How do you approach those local governments? I, Google is your best friend, okay? Google is <laughs> your best friend. I, I literally just go into Google. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'll write up, so we work with... Um, um, it's at the agriculture or department of fisheries. So department of fisheries, I literally just type that up when I say contact details and people that work, they all pop up. So the emails and numbers pop up. You send them an email, you tell them, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm Anga from South Africa and I want to save the world. <laughs> and they, they will respond. And if they don't respond, you email another person or you just put all of them in one email and just, literally hound them until they respond or call them and then the, you stop the conversation so yeah google is your first friend and then from google yeah you, you'll see i was asking this question because country like my country like pakistan reaching out government is not that easy you have to go through a lot of stages to actually reach them out so it's not very direct uh link okay. with them so um my next question is that what vision do you have for a more sustainable africa okay um definitely i i, I want to create i want to be to be part of the the the, the story of, of, of that I helped get communities um, sustainable employment and not seasonal because that's what happens a lot in, in South Africa, especially with um, our, our more or less fortunate communities. They get a lot of seasonal work. Um, and I really hope that with, 
with the ocean being such a, a, a huge um, asset to the world is that we tap into that and not just for the rich, but for the community at large. So I really hope that South Africa can um, invest in education, um, quality education, quality education, you know, um, where um, kids are exposed to, 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 um, exposed to different ideas because it's unfortunate that I only knew about seaweed when I got an opportunity to study overseas and go to Sweden, you know, and it's not like everyone gets an opportunity in South Africa. So I have to be, when you get an opportunity like that, you take as much as you can and you try, go back home and see what you can implement. So yeah, I'm hoping that, um, the government, um, supports South Africans that want to make sure South Africa um, gets to the next uh, stage in life. So yeah, that is my hope for South Africa is that we work all together in, in bettering our communities. Yeah. That's great. And um, like in the beginning, you mentioned that you specialized in the blue economy, but uh, for students like who are the beginners, would you like to explain what does this mean and how does it relate to climate change? Okay. Um, Ooh, so I studied um, sustainable development at NNMU, Nelson Mandela University. And in that course, there's so much you can learn from project management, how to project management from rural development, from farming, depending on, um, as you see with the SGD goals, there's so many, there's 17 or something. Mm -hmm. So there's different um, um goals within sustainability. So like for yourself, you're in finance, you know, I have no background in finance. So when you approach people, it would be more directly like to impact finance. So you see people that focus on finance, people that just focus directly on um, projects that work um, towards SGD goals. You know, there are people that just work with like NGOs or NPOs. So, and they work in the finance sector. So there's different, um, um, categories within the whole course. So mm -hmm. just make sure that you you are aligned with your, what you want for yourself. So don't just throw yourself into something that you really don't like. So I'm very about, um, I love communications. I love um, marketing and stuff like that. So for me, I love the fact that I can bring those two together with sustainability. So what I learned from sustainability, mm -hmm. and then I try market it and communicate that to other people. So there's different, um, yeah, there's different sectors within the sector. So as I said, just start any background. I think anyone can fit into the sustain, sustainable data for minimum course, whether you studied law, you know, there's ocean law now, you know, where you can protect oceans and protect um, um, what's happening in the ocean with fishing and, and farm, you know, you can tap into that. There's people like you as in finance, there's people like marketing, like myself. So whatever background you have, don't feel disheartened now that you have this degree, you can't now jump and come into sustainability. You can leave the corporate space. Well, well, actually sustainable data can be corporate as well. But as I mean, like you can just leave that space and focus more on um, SGD goals that are aligned with you. Definitely, there's a lot of opportunities there. Okay, that's great. And I would like to know for students who like, you know, they're feeling overwhelmed by climate change and like, you know, other uh, uh, crises that are happening, like, you know, recent turbulence from COVID, you can call it. Yeah. And how do you have some advice for that? Oh, Michelle, I also need advice about that. Oh. Like. <laughs> <laughs> because honestly, it's um, it becomes very disheartening, you know, especially when you sometimes watch stuff like Conspiracy or Netflix and all these shows and you're like, wow, there's, you know, there's so much happening. Mm -hmm. But as I said, um, I believe that there's a ripple effect. So if you start in your community, there's a ripple effect that you do. So for me, I see it like when I, especially when I go out and I work with kids, and you see how, you know, they get enlightened by what you're saying. You can see that spark in their mind. And those are the, the most important ones I feel for now is like, I really think they will make a difference because the older generation, it's like, they sometimes can be very stubborn. And I feel like if, I think if they really wanted to make a change and, you know, they could, 
but it's 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 really forced down to us at the last year to like no you guys should be fighting for climate change when big corporations have the biggest responsibility and have a lot of power and and and, and capital to stop a lot of things mm. but as i said um don't be disheartened by that because there are kids that are looking up to you there are community members that are looking up to you and i think it really begins with you it starts with you Mm-hmm. And I, I, I try my utmost best to live a very sustainable, um, you know, minimalistic life. And then also I, 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 I just spread that to my family and friends. And yeah, and that's, that's how it starts. And I, uh, in the beginning, you also mentioned that you have like your website. Um, what is it called? My website is called Ole Blue, O-L-E-B-L-U. And basically my website is just, uh, yeah, it's just, it just gives you some information about my, my company. Yeah. Okay. And, um, it's just like, um, it's not meant to create any awareness. It's just about your, um, what initiative you have taken. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, I do mention, um, I definitely do mention the SGD goals that I tackle. So um, you'll get a, a gist of, okay, this initiative focuses on this and um, and how it's good for the climate and the environment. So you do get a gist of that, but it's mostly about, um, yeah, what is the business about and who what we, we offer as a business. I have a question, Inga. That for example, we talk about one particular thing. Do you think we only can look into one thing in, you know, isolation without thinking about other factors? Because, you know, when we talk about like blue ocean, there's so many other things connected with that water resource. It's a water management. How do you, uh, you know, manage your waste? How do you uh, help the animal? So animal life. Then you talk about poverty. How does it affect the poverty? How does it actually uh, leads to prosperity? So all these SDG goals, they're connected together and it becomes a very complicated game. Like, you know, it's a transnational problem. We say that, you know, it could be solved at a very transnational level. But at a very like, you know, um, at a broader, you know, uh, scale, how do you see that how, you know, when you have looked at COP26, the, there was no like much, you know, uh, result of that. How do you see that, you know, as a in, as an individual nation, how people could actually contribute towards this uh, climate change goal? Mm, that's a good question. Um, we... It's, I think we really need um, maybe organizations in terms of like universities and um, groups, certain groups of individual key, key figures um, in communities, key figures in varsities, high schools, churches, all coming together to voice their opinions um, about what's currently happening. So you see that here in South Africa in some um, cases, you know, like I remember now a good example would be they were trying to, Shell was trying to do some testing in one of the oceans um, in the Eastern Cape. They were trying to do some um, um, testing to see if there's petrol or that they could mine some petrol in, in our oceans. And that became like a frenzy. People were striking, you know, people were on Instagram, people are sharing. And it was the whole thing was canceled, you know. So I think definitely when people come together and we, we are we are striking, we are so social media, we signing petitions, our voices do get heard. And, and, and it starts, as I said, it starts with just key people coming together and promoting this. So I really hope that we can continue having conversations and being around more likely minded people. Cause if the conversation is not there, then nothing's going to happen. So it's really starts with the conversation coming together and then we take action towards influencing our policies and we, 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 we speak to p- people who are official in government and we show them, hey, look, there are 20,000 people who've signed this, who are part of this government, I mean, of this country, and they, they don't want this to happen, you know. So I think definitely conversation is very, very important and just being... Um, around like-minded people that uh, are fighting for the same for cause. 
Thank you, Enga. I think I've learned a lot from you that how you can actually take initiative and be motivated and also not uh, think that, you know, you don't have finances, so you can't start the initiative. You could just, you know, start the initiative by joining some groups through LinkedIn and other networking sites and also trying to um, learn from others as well and working together and having awareness as well as educational programs to uh, create awareness. So thank you so much. Chenga for giving us time. Uh, it was a great conversation with you. Have a lovely evening. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Hamoush, and I'm a student of the Master of Environmental Management here at UNSW. I'm really excited to be joined today by Kevin Tai. Kevin Tai is a climate justice activist and, activist and environmentalist based in Soy, Kenya. He is currently the African Regional Coordinator and co-founder of the Kenyan Environmental Action Network, or KEEN, and a campaigner with Food at COP. So Kevin, thank you for being here. You live in Soy, a village in Kenya, and have co-founded the Kenyan Environmental Action Network. Could you tell us a little bit about why you founded this group and what you hope that it will achieve across the country? Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. As you're saying, my name is Kevin Mutai. So the reason why we co-found the Kenyan Environmental Action Network is because we were able to find the gap here in Kenya related to this field of activism and also environment, especially in people in marginalized area and also people in, in rural area. Because you have been finding most of the organization, they're only based in Nairobi, in the capital city or in the city. So the reason why we formed this is to educate and also to give platform, especially to these upcoming activists and also upcoming environmentalists to support them and with different types of resources, with different types of moral support. That's the reason why we formed a Kenyan Environmental Action Network here in Kenya. Mm. And can you tell me a little bit about the challenges that are faced by African activists, particularly activists that are outside of big cities like Nairobi? Okay, yeah, most of the challenge we have been facing, especially uh, for activists who are not based in town, is lack of uh, opportunity because you have been finding most of the opportunity that are usually offered with those people who are in town, uh, talking about uh, uh, finance resources uh, and different types of resources and also different types of, of opportunity or fellowship like also scholarship because you have been find most of the people who are living in rural areas have not been given this chance because they don't have any platform and you will find these people in town because we have like different universities which are offering uh, like uh, environmental course as a course in the institution so it is it will usually be easier for them to get those platforms like fellowship a workshop but those people who live in the village it's very difficult for them to be able to access and also talking about also media opportunity for them to share their story we usually find like most of these people they are not given a chance to share their story and also talking about because uh, there's a time i was organizing and i showed the one who called lead uh, friday for future kenya here so there's a time which we had a strike and uh, uh, I had a call with one of the biggest media, international media, to come and cover the story in your area. But the person rejected and decided to go and cover the story in, in the in the city of Nairobi, which in the in the rural area we had like big number of people doing that uh, demonstration. But in Nairobi we had like a small number, so they end up using the picture of our rural area and write down there in Nairobi. So those are the uh, like. Uh, a problem and also a disadvantage most of the activists, especially from rural area, they usually face. Mm, and that really goes right to the root of climate justice, which is giving people who may not have historically had a voice, platforming them and allowing them to speak their mind and to tell their needs and interests on a global scale or a national scale. So you're also the African Regional Coordinator for Earth Uprising. Could you talk a little bit more about the importance of having a strong African voice in the international climate movement? Okay, yeah. So to the reason uh, to have like um, to find like different people who are 
here in Africa, but they are also be, they are been able to give a platform also to participate in this international, big international like organization, especially youth organization. We have been seeing that it also because as we come down, we have been able to experience that the people who are being affected by this climate uh, climate change impact, there are people from Africa, there are people from global south. Mm -hmm. So uh, the importance of them to be in those like those uh, international organizations, it's very important for them to share the, their problem they are, they are facing so that they can spotlight it and also they can campaign because you have been finding like different international media they actually cover the story of this international organization not local organization so it's very important especially for people from africa people from global south to be given a chance and those international big international organizations so that they can pour out their problem they can also share their problem out because as you talk you know that uh, uh, most of this uh, global warming and also carbon emission they are caused by this uh, global north country but the people who are suffering these people from global south so it's very important for them to be in those uh, like uh, big organization because talking about marginalized area, talking about indigenous people, talking about youth. So it's very important for those people to, to be given a chance and in high position also to, uh, to be in those uh, organizations. Mm, mm, that's very true. And that makes me think about um, something that is platformed in the international climate movement, which is the polluter pays principle, where we're looking at countries in the global north who are causing a lot of this harm. The harm is being felt by countries in the global south. So that responsibility really needs to be put back on those wealthier countries to address these issues. So speaking of that, in 2021, you traveled to Sweden, London, and then Glasgow to attend the COP26 conference. And you've also participated virtually in mock COP conferences. Can you tell me a little bit about your experiences at these events and what you learned? Okay, I can start with mock COP. Um, so mock COP, uh, mock COP was just like, uh, uh, it was a, a form of COP26, but organized by youth, because this idea came out at uh, the time COP and also UK government, they were able, UNFC C, they were able to postpone COP26, COP uh, which was to have been happening in Glasgow. And knowing that, uh, you know, when you are postponing and uh, climate change impact, they are still going on. So youth from the UK, especially from the SOS, uh, they were able to, to come up with an idea of organizing a youth, uh, a youth COP virtual. That's why they came up with the name MOCOP. So I, I got an invitation uh, to be one of the event coordinator, one of the organizer uh, from Africa. And it was a good opportunity for me because this uh, COP wanted to show, especially the world leader and the uh, organizer of, of COPs that even you, they can be given a chance to organize this uh, climate talks and also a climate conference because during that uh, COP one of our one of our aim and also mission was to make sure that more COP is very inclusive, uh, more COP is uh, ambitious and it was well because we were able most we were able to to uh, to venture fully into these people from indigenous people from the rural area people from global south that's why we had we were able to come up with different types of uh, with uh, with our recommendation which we were able to submit it to the uh, cop uh, uh, cop 26 which was, which was happening in glasgow and through that we were able to show that the world even youth it's high time for you now to give the, the chance to the youth to organize this cop it's not about this so it's high time so after that i was able to get a chance uh, because i was running i was also co-leading another i was leading another strike which was happening around the world and um, try to to stop standard chartered bank uh, for for funding fossil fuel and also giving on to this fossil fuel company. So after doing that strike, I was able to get a message from uh, from my friend that uh, we were the people who have been selected because you we are leading this uh, strike to go to to go to Sweden 
and then to London, and then to, to Glasgow to attend COP26. Sport is also a really great way to bring together communities and engage on these issues. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience hosting soccer tournaments in the Salba to generate interest in protecting the environment? Okay, yeah, so uh, talking about, uh, yeah, because living in a community and living uh, in in a village where people doesn't believe in climate change. So, you know, some uh, strike, even I was talking to most of the Friday for Future people that strike in my area doesn't work because we live in a place where you need to come up with a tactic of including all people. If you're going to organize a strike in my area, you will get like few youth member because people, they see like you're a rebel and you want to do something bad. But that is the reason which I came up with the idea of what can I organize in my village which I can get attention of all ages, of all people coming in, uh, helping me to, to do this. That is the time I was able to come to see that uh, most people in my area, they love watching football. They love watching football. So that is the time I was able to, because I did one strike, I did one tournament on December uh, after just coming from the UK. I did one on, on, on 29th and 30th. Uh, December and uh, uh, more than like uh, uh, 400 people they were able to show up. So I used that as an opportunity to educate them and also to give them knowledge about climate change and how to conserve the environment. And then after that, because uh, they were trying to tell me, can you organize another one? Can you organize another one? Because it also give people to coming together. And also through that, you, you have been able to promote a, a unity in our area. Not only you are fighting, uh, educating people about climate change, but also you are creating bonding. You are creating also a lot of people uniting and come together to fight one common enemy. So uh, that is the time they, they approach me again, they say, please, can you organize for us another tournament? That's why I'll be organizing another one on 19 up to 22, up to 22nd, which is the uh, Earth Day. So I wanted to celebrate the final during the Earth Day and then we'll be planting trees, we'll be cutting cake, and that's as we'll be celebrating with the local people because now they have been able to understand what is climate change. So that's why I'll be doing this tournament uh, to educate them more and also to tell them more what is happening around the world related to climate change, even in our area currently, because we are experienced like uh, uh, we, are, we are experienced like uh, a shortage of water because more oils are drying. People are searching for water. This is another thing which I'm going also to use to share with them this is the effect of climate change. Mm, it's great to have such creative and fun solutions and it would really help draw people in that maybe weren't engaged in climate activism in the first place. Um, so what projects are you working on now and what are you looking forward to in the future? Okay, so um, the project which I'm working on right now is um, uh, co-founding Kim, a Kenyan Environmental Action Network. We have a project which we have been running since last year. It's known as Bustani Garden, which is just a kitchen garden where we, we have been visiting schools, especially primary school in marginalized area, uh, uh, developing and also installing kitchen garden. This I'm talking about nursery, uh, a vegetable nursery, and also planting uh, different types of indigenous trees. And through that, we have been able to educate them more about climate change, how they can conserve soil, how they can borrow that knowledge up to their home. So that is another project which you are, I'll be doing. And the way I say, apart from the tournament, you are, I'll be having another project with the Kenya Army, the trainee want to become army uh, because I live near the barracks, the, the, the training school, which had, which have more than, that school have more than 5,000 trainee who want to become a soldier. So they invited me there to plant with them uh, 3,000 plus tree with them. So I saw this is a good opportunity also for me to go there and educate them. Mm, fantastic. So it looks like you've got a very busy schedule ahead of you. Um, to, to, finish, <laughs> to finish off, could you tell me a little bit about how you sustain your activism over time? And what might you tell other people that are looking to participate in this kind of work? Don't like to imitate what people, what other people are doing. Just be yourself. 
because maybe you want to be like greater, but you may fail. You want to be like someone else, these famous people, activism, but you may fail. But if you are going to be yourself, you're going to succeed in this field. It's not like uh, also an easy field because for me to start in this field, it was not easy uh, because I was living, my childhood was living in Nairobi, in Nairobi, in one of the biggest slums known as Kibera. So the time this, the reason why I was able to join this field, uh, during my childhood in two or three, my mother was able to pass away and uh, he was able to pass away because of drinking contaminated water. That's the reason why I, I say, you know, I think it's high time for me to join this field, knowing that uh, uh, I was able to study a medical field, that's medical laboratory science. But uh, after graduating, I was able to quit to venture fully in this field of climate activism and uh, environmental uh, conservation. So, and it was not easy for me because most people in my area, they were seen like uh, mad, or why are you leaving this field, which it has a lot of opportunity and uh, good job opportunity and going to ending placards in the street and doing this in the street. So it was not easy for me because I got a lot of uh, mocking messages from the family, from the friend, from everyone. So it was not easy, but I actually say, if you are passionate about things and uh, you can't maybe change your way because they usually say uh, the way of success, it usually have a lot of temptation and a lot of meander. So it's for you to, to see which things you want. If you want to fight for this, just keep fighting and one day change will come and people will listen to you. Yeah. And through that, uh, because after fighting that, I didn't mention to you that last year in Kenya, I was able to be named one of the most top 100 influential people in Kenya. Yeah, and it was also like a, a victory to me because now that I was able to see now Kenyan government and also people from, from uh, in Kenya that are now recognizing me to be one of the influential people alongside the big names, minister, uh, media personnel, and also billionaire. I, I was able to mention among them. So it was like a plus for me. Mm, it's so inspiring to hear your story and how you got to where you are. And it's fantastic to hear about your passion as well, because I think that really comes through in the kind of work that you do. So thank you so much for sitting down with me and taking the time to talk to us. It's been a really great conversation. Hi, my name is Ishata Bhartia. I'm an architect pursuing my fourth semester of master's in technology. And I'm specializing in urban development management from Terry School of Advanced Studies, New Delhi, India. Currently, I'm interning with GIZ, which is the technological arm for Germany's KFW Development Bank as a GAG emission modeler. I'm working with the NDC Transport Initiative Asia project in the India component. My research is on developing a methodology to model tank to wheel emissions for urban freight performing last mile delivery for e-commerce with Delhi as a case study. It's essentially a tool to model the carbon emissions for a grocery delivery from the shop to your house. Micro mobility of goods in India has gained impetus during the pandemic years. I too went from no food delivery app to ordering coffee online every day. According to an IBF report, 2021, Indian e-commerce is expected to reach 350 billion USD by 2030. Studies have shown that e-commerce does not necessarily mean a reduction of trips. Increased frequency of customized deliveries leads to higher environmental and financial costs. Indian GAG emission modeling tools, such as IESS 2047 and GAG freight calculator do exist, but there are several gaps in mapping emissions for this new type of freight. My research aims to develop a tool for use by city governments for monitoring and managing urban freight emissions through EV policies and switch to cleaner fuels, as well as for organizations in aiding access to green finance for transition of their logistic fleets. The transport sector in India is in the middle of a paradigm shift. In 2018, the Indian transport tech sector accounted for the second highest energy consumption at 24% and contributed to 10% of the national total GHG emissions. A 2020 ICD report showed India's transport emission-related deaths to be 86,000 in 2015. 
India's national level transport strategies such as FAME and hydrogen mission are aiding the transition to sustainable mobility. McKinsey and Company in 2022 reported that developing countries like India need a higher share of 11% of their GDP to 2050 to achieve their net zero goals. At COP26, India asked for 1 trillion USD in green finance to achieve its targets. One major challenge to accessing green finance for transport in India is the inability to measure, report, and verify interventions. GAG emission modeling is just one such tool. Till recent years, GAG emission modeling was not even a part of the MTech curriculum at Terry SAS. One of the initiatives undertaken by the e-mobility team at GIZ, of which I'm a part, is to develop EV curriculum in Indian colleges. Hence, not only is climate change impacting future potential workplaces, but it's also impacting and transforming universities and colleges for students like me in India. As an urban development professional, this point of time in India is exciting and promising to say the least. In the future, I see myself working in urban sustainability, not necessarily in a particular sector, as I'm happy to report that development work is no longer being done in silos. With India's commitment to the Paris Agreement, COP26, as well as the Union Budget 2022-23, sustainability is the field with the maximum public and international financing aiding green recovery. Whether it is green finance or emissions modeling or climate conscious social housing, I see my future job prospects in sustainability. For me, this is the future. Without this, I feel there might not be a future. Hence, I feel this is where my work can have maximum impact. Thank you.